thank you for tonight, Lord. Uh, Lord, we, we worship you and we thank you that you sent your only begotten Son. And Lord, as we look through the book of Revelation, we see what happens to those who reject the gift of God. And so tonight, Lord, as we study your word, uh, I pray, Father, that you will help us to have compassion, help us to be exhorted, Lord, in our spirit to speak to others about you. For that day will come, and when it does, uh, Father, we're going to be gone. We're going to be gone with you, and the door will be shut, and this earth will suffer the judgment of God. So help us, Lord, tonight to be grateful that we know you, that we love you, that you love us more than we could ever understand. And I pray tonight, Lord, that as we study your word, that you will speak to each one of us. Help us, Lord, to shine the light for Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. You can be seated. We're in Revelation chapter 11. Man, scary stuff is going to happen here on the earth. Uh, David brought to me a scripture. It's Luke 17, right? 29 and 30. Yeah, just now. Yeah, Luke 17, 29 and 30. And it is what Jesus said is he said, As fire fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be when the Son of Man is revealed. And boy, you really have to look at words in the scripture because obviously words mean things. But remember, during the rapture, Jesus is not revealed. We're taken up, but he's not revealed. He's not revealed till he comes back with us. And just like Sodom and Gomorrah, when fire and brimstone rained down, it's going to be the same. The scripture uh, John tells us in uh, Revelation 19, verse 11, that he saw heaven opened, and he saw a white horse, and the one who sat upon the horse was called faithful and true. And the Bible said in righteousness he's coming to judge and make war. And then he says his eyes are like a flame of fire. And so he comes to tread out the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And so that's when he'll be revealed. So a lot of times when we look at one scripture, like Luke 17, and then we compare it with uh, Revelation 19, we see the word of God backs, backs the word of God. Uh, there's always other witnesses in the word of God to show us that we're correctly dividing the word of truth. Amen? So tonight, Revelation chapter 11, um, God finishes the second woe in this chapter. It includes bringing the two witnesses to earth. And these two witnesses will certainly bring even more judgment, and there'll be more death to mankind. So that's what chapter 11 is about. And we'll go ahead and start with, uh, with verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, There was given to me a reed like unto a rod. So, so it's John speaking here. And he said, and I always kind of look at it this way. I have a, how many of you have these anymore? A yardstick made out of wood. <laughs> my, my, mine, I think, is an antique now. But I think of that as a, as a measuring stick. And sometimes I'm, I don't want to unlock my toolbox and get out my tape measure that goes 50 feet. So I pull off the, the wooden one off the wall and use that as a, as a rod or a measuring stick. So John is saying here, there was given to me a reed like a rod. And the angel stood and said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship therein. But the court that is outside the temple, leave it out. Don't measure it. It is given unto the Gentiles and unto the holy city and they will tread it underfoot forty and two months. So here is another sign of three and a half years. It's the three and a half years uh, of God's wrath that's going to continue. And I, I know a lot of people say, well, the tribulation period is seven years. Well, yes, it is. There's a false peace and a taking over. You know, the white horse had a bow but no arrows, and then pestilence, and then the red horse, and then the black horse, and so on. So, yeah, there is a three and a half year period that starts tribulation. 
But the great tribulation, the wrath of God, is three and a half years. And it's all throughout Scripture. We're going to take a look at a few of those uh, in a little while. But I want to talk about verses 1 and 2. In these verses, the Apostle John is put to work with a nine-foot ruler. And this happened to the prophet Ezekiel as well. It's interesting that God would use uh, a ruler, again, even in the Old Testament, to have Ezekiel. So let's take a look at that. Just, there's just three verses there. And that would be Ezekiel chapter 40, verses thir- um, 3 through 5. Ezekiel 40, 3 through 5. And it takes a while to figure out where all the books are in the Bible, doesn't it? So, I've kind of learned the Bible this way. The first five books are the books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then there's poetry and kings and chronicles, so it's history. And then after that, there's the book of Job. And then there's Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. Those are books of Solomon and David. And then after that are the major prophets. So it starts out with right after uh, Ecclesiastes, there's uh, Isaiah, and then Jeremiah, and then Ezekiel, and then Daniel, and then Hosea, Joel, Amos, and the rest of the minor prophets. So I kind of try to divide it into places like the books of Moses, history, poetry, and then prophets. So it's the third major prophet in Scripture, Ezekiel chapter 40. And this is what God says to him in chapter th- in verse 3, 40, verse 3. He brought me over there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed. And he stood in the gate. And the man said to me, Son of man, behold with your eyes, hear with your ears. And set your heart upon all that I will show you, for the intent that I might show them unto thee, uh, you are brought hither, declare all that you see to the house of Israel. So behold, there's a wall on the outside of the house, round about. In the man's hand there was a measuring reed of six cubits. Now a cubit is 18 inches. Okay, so you take 12 and 6 is 18. So that's 9 foot. It's the same thing, a 9 foot ruler. So he says, take a measuring reed of 6 cubits long by the cubit and a hand breadth. So, and that's 9 inches. So he measured the breadth of the building, one reed, and the height of it was one reed. So the width of the building was 9, uh, nine feet and the height of it was nine feet. So this is a little square building. And we could go on and on, but I just wanted to show you that God does use measuring reeds in the scripture, which brings me to this. (laughs) All the lines in heaven are straight. All the buildings are exact. Everything's measured. It's all perfect. And it's not OCD. It's it's God's (laughs) organization of how things are done decently and in order. Amen? So uh, let's go back to verses 1 and 2 in Revelation 11. And my whole point there was, is the verse describes John measuring the tribulation temple, the outer court is given to the Gentiles. The scripture says it's given to the Gentiles in the holy city, and they will tread it under for 40 and 2 months, or three and a half years. You know, Jesus also predicted this in his earthly ministry. He predicted the same, very same thing. If you look it up with me in Luke 21 and verse 34. So the book of Luke, uh, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke, the third book in the New Testament, Luke 21 and verse 24. These are the words of Christ. He said, And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And that is three and a half years. There will be three and a half years of God's wrath until that's fulfilled. Okay? And then the scripture says, because of all of that, there'll be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. There'll be 
distress of nations, perplexity, the sea and waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, looking for the things that are coming on the earth, because the powers of heaven will be shaken. And here's just one more scripture that lines up with uh, Luke 17, 29 and 30, that talks about, as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah when the brimstone fell and the fire fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, so it's going to be coming when the Son of Man is revealed and if you look at the next verse, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And so when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. So he didn't say when you see that to come to pass. He said when you see these things, what things? Signs in the sun, moon, and stars, distress of nations, men's hearts failing them for fear. He says when you see all that happening, lift up your heads, because you know that your redemption is drawing near. So all of those things have been happening. And <laughs> I think they're past beginning. Now they're, we're into it. So uh, it's really interesting how all of this lines up. And again, we're going to look at some scriptures to show in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the 42-month final tribulation period, three and a half years, is referred to in the following verses of scripture. So let's go to Daniel. Now you were in Ezekiel. So Daniel is right after the book of Ezekiel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then Daniel. Okay, and it's Daniel's right before Hosea. So we're going to look at Daniel chapter 7. And why is it important for the three and a half years? Well, to understand it, we can search the scripture and equate it correctly instead of misinterpreting scripture. God makes it really clear his wrath is going to be three and a half years. You know, Jesus referred to that. And he said, except those days would be shortened, no flesh would be saved. So about three and a half years is all that it's, it's going to take uh, until this earth is nearly destroyed. And then it was interesting, uh, there was a question on the, this little site that I'm on. There's five of us on there. And this guy brought up a question, a scientific question. He said, NASA says that there's only about 10 years left of what the earth can support as far as life and uh, the, the birth rate and everything else, it'll only last about 10 more years. And he said, have you guys heard of this? And they were discussing it back and forth. And somebody wrote on the side, well, we know for sure it's going to last at least 1,000 years, so NASA is wrong. <laughs> you know, because when Jesus comes back, we're going to be in a 1,000-year uh, millennium kingdom. And then after that, the earth and its works are going to be burned up. So don't listen to this stuff when scientists come on and, you know, there's only 10 years left in global warming and blah. No, there's going to be at least a thousand more years if the rapture happened tomorrow. Actually, it'll be 1,000, uh, uh, 1,003 and a half years. <laughs> Okay, so in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And he will speak great words against the Most High. This is talking about the Antichrist. He will wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they will be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of a time or half a time. So think about it. Time is one year in scripture times another two, that's three, and then the dividing of a time or half a time. A time times and half a time is three and a half years. So in other words, the Antichrist is going to come to power, and for three and a half years, God's wrath is going to fall, and the Antichrist is going to take over. And we're going to be reading in that in just a couple of chapters. We're in chapter 11, and when you get into 12, 13, and 14, that's when he comes to power and forces people to take the mark. So let's, let's take another look. Daniel 12 and verse 7. So I heard the man who was clothed in linen, Daniel 12, verse 7, which was upon the waters of the river, and when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever that it will be for a time, times, and a half. And when he is accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things 
shall be finished. So when you line that up with Matthew chapter 24, Matthew 24, the first half, Jesus is talking to his disciples about the, the destruction of the temple, about his coming to the clouds, and then about his return to the earth. Because they ask three questions. When shall these things be? The, the destruction of the temple, when will be the sign of your coming, and the sign of the end? That's in Matthew 24, verses 1 through 3. So once you get through that, Jesus says in verse 4, first of all, he, he, they want to know what time. Well, how's this going to happen? When's it going to happen? First thing he says is, let no man deceive you. Verse 4, Matthew 24, 4. Let no man deceive you. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and deceive many. And when you get halfway through the chapter in Matthew 24, or, uh, yeah, Matthew 24, then he turns his attention to the Jewish nation. So this makes perfect sense now. Let's read it again. This is discussing the Jewish nation, God's holy people. Okay, so when you read it again in that context, and that's Daniel 12 and verse 7. I heard the man clothed in linen who was on the waters by the river, and when he held up his right hand, his left hand to heaven, he swore by him who lives forever that it will be for a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years. And when he has accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, then all these things shall be finished. Now watch Daniel. Do you think Daniel had wisdom? Daniel uh, interpreted dreams. He had great wisdom from the Lord. But check out the next verse, verse 8. I heard, but I didn't understand. And I said, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So Daniel couldn't understand. And you know what's really great about the time we're living in? We understand. Listen to what he told Daniel. He said, Daniel, go your way. The words are closed and sealed until the time of the end. So God said, basically he could have said, Daniel, your generation isn't going to know this. Neither are the following generations all the way up until the end generation, which I believe we are, the end generation. And at that time, these things will be revealed. And man, if you've been checking out anything at all that's going on in the world, did you know that the Euphrates River is drying up? And when we get into the chapters here in the next couple of chapters, it talks about the Euphrates River drying up to make a way for the kings of the east to come over and attack Israel. And it's like, what? The, one of the biggest rivers in the Mideast is drying up? It's insane. I mean, prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. So now we've had two witnesses just in the book of Daniel, three and a half years. Then we go on to Revelation chapter 12. So we're in 11 now. So you've got to just look across the page. Revelation 12 and verse 6 says, And the woman. Now the woman is referred to as Israel in Scripture. Okay, And in, in chapter 12, there's kind of a history lesson that God talks about Israel and the dragon or Satan. So in verse 6, he says, The woman fled into the wilderness. I believe Israel's going to flee into a place called Petra. Uh, that's the standard belief among most Christians, is this canyon that's just big enough for a horse to fit through, a horse and a rider, uh, that, that God's people are going to hide there. And someone said, and I hope this is true, that if you took rocks from Petra and boiled them, they're protein. You could drink that and it would be protein, food to live on. It's amazing what God can do. I mean, if you think of it this way, you take a brown seed and you put it in brown ground, and pretty soon a brown stalk comes up. Then green leaves form on the stalk, and then red apples form on the green leaves. How's that happen from a brown seed? <laughs> See, my point is, God can do what he wants to do. And God will do what he wants to do. And so here in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6, he says, The woman, Israel, fl flies into, or flees into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God for her, that she will be fed there for 1,260 days. Three scores, scores 20. So three scores 60. 1,260 days. 1,260 days is three and a half years. Three and a half years. And you know, we've got to remember what Scripture says. 
by two or three witnesses, every word will be established. And, and I thank the Lord that he's given me the ability to find more witnesses in Scripture, and he's given us the ability to find more witnesses all the way along Scripture to prove that this verse, yes, it means exactly that because it says it over here, it says it back here, it says it right here. So by two or three witnesses, every word will be established. But there's more. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5. The scripture says, Now there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He's obviously talking about uh, the Antichrist. And you could read all about that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where it says, And what will be revealed will be revealed until the one who uh, restrains is gone. Then that wicked one shall be revealed who exalts himself about er, above everything that is called God, okay? This is the Antichrist. This is who he's talking about here. He says, And power was given unto him to continue for 42 months. 12 months in a year, 36 and 3 years, and 6 more is 42. So three and a half years, three and a half years. Keep that in your mind because there's so many false prophets out there trying to take away our blessed hope. And the fact of it is, God has everything timed out perfectly. He even says that in Scripture. There's a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 tells us that. And then in verse 11, he tells us that everything, everything that's under the sun, God will make everything beautiful in its time. So God has a time, a timing. Even our life on this earth, Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto men, it's an appointment, once to die, and after this the judgment. So everybody in this room, everybody in this world has a, an appointed time to meet with the Lord. We just don't know when our time is. But you know, you can walk through the cemetery and you can see appointed times. You know where it says, born on this date, and died on this date. And I'm, nobody knows when their time is. And I think that's why Jesus said, while it is yet day, occupy until I come. While it is yet day, because the night is coming when no man can work. And we don't know when that night comes for us individually. Amen? So then we're going to go through verses 3 through 14 in Revelation chapter 11. So God says, I will give power to my two witnesses. You know, I thank God for that. He never leaves the earth without a witness. There's always a witness. When we're taken up, there's 144,000 Jewish witnesses that will witness on the earth. When they all get killed, God sends two witnesses. When they kill them, God sends an angel flying through the sky, preaching the everlasting gospel. God always gives a witness to everything. He doesn't leave us clueless, us or the world. He always gives witnesses. So in verse 3, he says, I'll give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy, and here we go again, a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. So there's the fifth witness of three and a half years. They're going to witness for three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks that will stand before the God of earth. And if any man hurts them, fire will come out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man hurts them, he must be in this manner killed. Killed in what manner? With fire. You come against these guys, fire comes out of their mouth. You say, is that possible? Now you see it in the circus. You know, but it's going to be worse than, way worse than that. These guys put a flammable liquid in their mouth and then light a match and spit it out. It's going to be, they can do it any time they want. Isn't that amazing? And in verse 6, he says, They have power to shut up the heaven so that it doesn't rain in the days of their prophecy. They have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all kinds of plagues as often as they want to. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and will overcome them and kill them. Now here's something that's really difficult to understand. God sends these two witnesses to the earth and then allows 
the enemy to kill them. Have you ever wondered why? Well, first of all, the witnesses already have eternal life. They already know where they're going. But second of all, God does that to give another witness to the resurrection. Watch what happens. Their dead bodies will lay in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So this is going to happen in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus was crucified. And they of the people and the kindreds and tongues and nations will see their dead bodies for three and a half days. And they will not allow their dead bodies even to be put in graves. In other words, they get killed and they lay in the street and nobody will allow them to be buried. They just lay them there in the street. And the Bible says in verse 10, those who live upon the earth will rejoice over them and make merry. They'll have a party. And they will send gifts one to another. So it's almost like a, a Christmas to them. They're going to send gifts one to another. You can imagine what the worldlings will be saying. They think, you know, well, they won't say thank God. They'll probably say thank the Antichrist that they're dead now and that they can't blow fire on us anymore or send down fire or turn the water into blood or all those other things. And they'll be thankful they'll send gifts one to another because of the two prophets tormented them who dwelt upon the earth. And after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God will enter back into them. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I've heard and we've read in scripture in John chapter 4, or uh, John chapter 11, I mean, that after three days, he stinketh. <laughs> you remember that scripture? Uh, Oh, our brother's been in the grave for three and a half, four days, whatever it was. He stinks now. That's just a normal process of bacteria and everything else that happens to a body that's deceased and begins to decay. That's just God's way of taking care of that. So I want you to see this. After three and a half days, the spirit of life from God will enter into them and they will stand upon their feet. How scary is that? They come back alive. And great fear will fall upon all those who see them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Can you imagine that? Hearing this great voice from heaven, obviously God, saying, Come back up here. And they will ascend back up into heaven in a cloud while their enemies are beholding them or watching them. So remember Acts chapter 1 when they were all gathered around, about 500 men saw Jesus, and they, they lifted, Jesus lifted up into the sky. Now he gives the earth a double witness. Two resurrections at once and watches them go up into the clouds. And the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and one-tenth of the part of the city fell, and in the earthquake there were killed of men, 7,000 people, and the rest of them were affrighted, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. And now the second woe is past, and the third woe is coming quickly. Wow, that's a lot. So in verses 3 through 14, this section of chapter 11 describes the ministry of the two witnesses from God. And God doesn't specifically name the two witnesses, but he gives us some hints in Scripture. You know, I've seen churches get in a huge argument about this. We won't even be here. Who cares? You know, praise God, whoever he sends. At least it's not us. I don't want to come back here, do you? Not, not until I come back with Jesus. But somebody gets to come back here. And there's some hints in Scripture. We don't know for sure, but here's what Scripture says. And it really doesn't matter anyway, but I thought it was fun just to study it out and say, well, what, what is the word? Does the word have anything to say about this at all? So let's take a look. Revelation chapter 10 so remember, we just studied that. In Revelation chapter 10 and verses 10 and 11, the Bible says, this is John speaking, I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth, sweet like honey, 
But as soon as I ate it, my belly, my belly was bitter. And he said, that's the angel, said to him, John, you must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. Now, whether that means that John was going to be used greatly to preach to people in his time, or if it was for a future time, I don't know. But he did say, you're going to prophesy before men, before kings, and before nations. Okay? Then there's this other scripture about Enoch. Now, the Bible tells us not too much about Enoch, except that Enoch was walking with God, and then he was not. <laughs> So if you're not, it means you're not there. So somehow, and I, I always think about this, well, maybe God just found one person that he thought, I better take him before he messes up too. So <laughs> I don't know. But it said he walked with God. He was, he was walking with the Lord. So let's take a look. Genesis chapter 5. You know, the word of the Lord is, is really entertaining. There's a lot of things in here that, you know, like Daniel, I hear it, but I don't understand it. And then if you keep studying it, you find all these little hints here and there. So let's take a look. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21 through 24. Now Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. Now remember, do you remember how old Methuselah was? 969 years old. You say, how is that possible? Well, in those days, there was like a canopy. It was before the flood. There was like a canopy over the earth that blocked out the harmful rays of the sun. And then God watered the earth from springs that came from below. So people lived a lot longer. But as time went on, as you would read it, if you read it in Genesis chapter 6, every thought of man was continually evil and God had to destroy the earth with the flood. But this is before the flood. And the Bible says Enoch lived 65 years and he had Methuselah. And the Bible says Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah for 300 years. So now he's 365 years old. And he begat sons and daughters. So don't say again, I'm too old to have children. <laughs> okay. The guy was 365 years old and he had sons and daughters. Verse 23. Now all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Well, what happened? Verse 24. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And Methuselah lived uh, uh, 187 years and begat Lamech. And then uh, you'll see if you keep reading in that chapter that Methuselah lived to be 969 years old. So at 365 years old, God looked down at Enoch and said, come on home. Now some people say, well then Enoch didn't die. He has to be one of the witnesses. You could assume that, but I know this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So Enoch had to give up his body. And so did Elijah, which we're going to read about here in a minute. Uh, so let's take a look at Malachi chapter 4. Malachi, that's right before Matthew. And that's an easy way to remember where Malachi is. The two M's are together. So if you just go to Matthew and turn to your left, you'll be in Malachi. And when I first got saved, I thought he was an Italian prophet. So I thought he was Malachi. But somebody corrected me and said, no, that's Malachi. Okay, we're going to find out different when we get to heaven, the true pronunciation of his name. <laughs> Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So God gives this promise and then there's 400 years of silence where there's no more books of the Bible written. After Malachi, the last prophet, God waited 400 years hundred years to speak to his people again through the Lord Jesus and the star and the, and the birth in Bethlehem. So there's a 400 year space in there. What does that remind you of? People of Israel were in bondage for 400 years. So here's another, here's your sign, another 400 years. So he says, I'm sending you Elijah the prophet. Now we know 
that God didn't send Elijah, but what he did do is he sent the same spirit that dwelt in Elijah into John the Baptist. And so how Elijah prophesied in his time, God sent that same Holy Spirit that indwelt Elijah when he preached, and that same spirit was in John the Baptist. That's what he's talking about. But look at Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17 and verse 11. So you got to turn to your right, get in Matthew 17 and then verse 11. Okay, so the disciples in verse 10 asked him saying, why then did the scriptures say that Elias or Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, verse 11, Elias truly shall come and restore all things. So that almost makes you feel like Elijah is going to come back as one of these witnesses. So I just thought it was kind of interesting to study all of this. The two witnesses ministry includes, think about what God said in those verses that we read, prophesying, preventing the rain whenever they wish, turning water into blood, smiting the earth with every kind of plague. So keep in mind, this is God's plan of mercy in an attempt to turn sinners to Christ. You know, when I first studied the book of Revelation, I thought, yeah, there's God with a baseball bat and he's whacking people. Not so. It is wrath. It is judgment. But there's a purpose and a motive to God's judgment. You know, God looks at our hearts, not necessarily just judges us by our actions, but he looks at our hearts. Amen. What's your motive for doing all of this? What were you thinking about? Was this about you? Was this about me? Was this about, what was this about? And so God is looking at motives and the, his motive, truly, when you study scripture, you can tell his motive because he says, after these plagues, they did not repent, but they blasphemed the God of heaven. So you could see that his purpose was to get people to repent. And then he saddened, sad, sad, sadly says, they didn't repent. So then I sent this plague but they didn't repent. So then I sent, you see the heart of God in that? It is yes to judge, of course, but the judgment has a motive to bring people to Christ. You know, it's kind of like a parent that disciplines their child. It's not to hurt the child. It's to discipline the child to do the right thing. And, and so when you look at it that way, it's, it's, not, it's not to harm. It's to bring on the right path. And that's exactly what God's doing here in the book of Revelation. So the two witnesses are eventually killed by the Antichrist. And that's when all the earth celebrates their deaths through a hellish type celebration where it's much like Christmas. Men send gifts one to another. So the two witnesses' bodies lay in the street for three and a half days. And after that, they're resurrected. A great voice calls them up to heaven. You remember Revelation 11 verse 12. They hear this voice come back up here. Okay? At that time, fear falls on everyone, and a great earthquake levels one-tenth of Jerusalem and kills 7,000 prominent men. Now, I just wanted to make a note here that it wasn't just one man. Again, it was two men that are resurrected before the people's eyes. Two men. And they still won't believe. So let's check that out in Scripture. If somebody rises from the dead, will people believe? No. You know, we've risen from the dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And we've been resurrected into new life. And I've still got relatives that say, yeah, well, we remember when you were a kid. And, eh, you know, you can believe that if you want, but we don't believe. So even though they see the change, man, I remember my two buddies, uh, Rick and Billy, that came up from Pomona to find out why I wasn't partying with them anymore. And I remember sitting them on the couch and telling them my whole story, how I got saved. And, 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 and one of them, I can't remember, I think it was Billy that had tears and they were listening to my story and just saying, God, you so needed to do that. That's so awesome. And when I said, well, how about you guys? Do you want to get saved? They just said, no, nah, we, we're enjoying our life. And that's the last time I saw them. 
Though one rise from the dead, they will not repent. Let's check that out in Scripture, Luke chapter 16. I talked about it this morning in my, uh, my message to the church. Luke 16 is about the rich man and Lazarus. And you go through this whole story, which we did this morning, and it talks about the Lazarus dying and being carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, which is in the center of the earth called paradise. Then it talks about the rich man dying and being right directly in hell. And then the rich man sees Lazarus in paradise and calls out to Father Abraham and says, can you please send Lazarus to dip his finger in cool water and cool my tongue? And, and Father Abraham says, no. No, because there's a great canyon between us or a great gulf fixed. So it's a place that you can't cross. No swinging bridge. And so he says, those that are there can't pass to us. And those that are here can't pass over there. You know, that's a great promise for eternal salvation as well. You know, the devil might tell you, oh, you're going to go to hell. The fact of it is, Jesus said, whoever believes in me shall not perish, but has been passed from death to life. You've been passed over and you can't pass back over. Well, you could pass back over if you didn't believe, but it's really hard to not believe when the Holy Spirit lives in you. You know, and I've heard of some people said, yeah, well, that guy said he was saved and he went to church for five years and now he's serving the devil. I don't know that he was really truly ever saved. You know, I think if you're truly born again, God will discipline you and bring you back to the right road. But if you're not saved, you can fake it. You know, there's all kinds of, of uh, people that snuck in secretly, Peter says, and came into the body of Christ. They weren't Christians at all. They were false sheep. They were sheep in wolves' clothing. So that can happen too. But here in Luke 16, God talks about if someone rises from the dead, will people repent? Well, this rich man in verse 27 says, okay, so I can't, I can't come from here to you and you can't come from there to me. So I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. So now he's, he's remembering, he has a memory, that his father has a house back up on earth. And he says, I have five brothers there. Send him that he can testify to them so that they don't have to come to this place of torment because the rich man was in hell. And Abraham said to him, no, no. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And it's what I taught earlier. They have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the books of Moses, and prophets. They have Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and Daniel and, and Jeremiah and Hosea and Joel and Amos and, and Zechariah and Zephaniah and all the rest. They have Moses and the prophets. They have the Bible. Let them hear them. But he protested and said, No, no, Father Abraham. If somebody went to them from the dead, they'll repent. And he said, If they won't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now think about this. We have this in the scripture. In John chapter 11, where Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, he that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. There were a whole bunch of people standing around that saw this. If you remember the story correctly, the Bible says some believed. Others went back and ratted him out to the Pharisees and said, you ought to see what he's doing now. He's going to turn the whole nation to himself. So some people saw Lazarus come out of the grave and they still didn't believe. And so God gives two witnesses here in Revelation chapter 11 of the resurrection. Still, they don't believe. So in verses 15 through 19 in Revelation chapter 11, and that'll end up the chapter, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And so the 24 elders who sat before God on their seats, although obviously they had bodies that they could sit and they had seats, they fell on their faces and they worshipped God. And John saw this. And they said, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which are and was and are to come. 
because you have taken to you your great power and you have reigned. And all the nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they would be judged and that you should give reward to your servants the prophets and to the saints and those who fear your name, small and great. And you should destroy those who which destroy the earth. And so the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, or the ark of the covenant. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great hail. Wow, the third woe. It's beginning to come. So in verses 15 through 19, you got, number one, the citizens of heaven are rejoicing. That's us. We'll be there. And we're rejoicing. Number two, the nations of the earth become angry. And so I, I want to just give you a note here in Revelation 10, 7. The Bible says, in the days of the seventh angel, the mystery of God will be finished. The mystery of God includes the long delay of our Lord in taking the kingdom to himself and in establishing righteousness on earth. And of course, that kingdom is the millennial kingdom. He talks all about it in Matthew 25 and in uh, Revelation chapter 19 towards the end and in chapter 20. So we're going to study all of that. So the mystery of God is seen in these thousands of years since creation in which sin and death have run rampant upon the earth. It's then that the seventh angel sounds the heralding of the soon coming of Christ to earth for the second time to rule and reign. Now this chapter is so interesting and I encourage you to take your notes and look through that and read through that again. And you'll see that our God is a merciful God. Amen. I mean, he could have just said, let's burn this place to the ground. And then we'll all go back and reoccupy it and turn it back into the Garden of Eden. But God doesn't do that. Oh, well, God burns it to the ground. But there's people that remain. And, and the interesting part of the whole thing when he comes back in Matthew chapter 25, if you want to take some time, when you get time, to look at the end of Matthew 25, he gives this speech and he says, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was sick, you came and visited me. And when I was in prison, you came to me. And the people who were the sheep of God say, Lord, when did we see you? Now, these are obviously people that were born after the crucifixion of Christ. They never saw him. But they said, when did we see you, Lord? And he said, because you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And then interestingly enough, he says, but to those on his left hand, remember when he first came, he divided the sheep among the, uh, from the goats. So there were people who made it through the tribulation period who believed, who believed and didn't take the mark and didn't get killed for not taking the mark. And then he tells the ones on his left hand, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. And so on and so forth. And they said, when did we not give you drink or feed you or visit you? And he said, because you didn't do it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you didn't do it to me. And then, sadly enough, that chapter ends with him saying, so then shall he say unto those on his right hand, come, you beloved, you blessed, inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And man, you could run right over that scripture. I want you to think about this. When the crunching of the garden was happening with Adam and Eve, when they were crunching the fruit, the, the fruit, Jesus was already planning on coming from the foundation of the world. Think about that. The world was dark and without void, Genesis chapter 1. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. So that's the foundation of the world. When God decided to let earth be a place that could be inhabited by Adam and the animals and everything else he created. That's the foundation of the world. And he said, come, you blessed, inherit the kingdom which has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Before we were ever born, God was thinking about us. Before we were ever born, God knew who we were. Before we were ever born, God knew that we would receive him because he can look down the corridors of time. And that's how he could predestinate us is because he already saw it. He already saw it all happen. 
I don't understand any of that. I mean, I understand that he knew us, but I don't see how God saw all the way down the corridors of time till 20, well, in my case, till 1952 and some of you uh, later, how he could see us being born, see us receiving him, see us serving him, see us in glory. But he says we are now seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're already there. So I don't understand how all of that works, but just like flipping on a light switch, I just believe it. Yeah, I don't have to sit and look at the light switch and say, I don't know how this works, so I'm not sure that I want any light. No, I want the light. I just flip it on. I don't care how it works. It just works. The day that I'll be shocked is when I flip it on and the electricity's out. Uh, and that may be the day that we get taken up. Amen. Amen. So it's such an interesting book. And there's so many people that are afraid to look into the book of Revelation because it's so mysterious. But when you read it, you know, word for word, and you study it literally, think about who God wrote it to. He wrote this love letter to us. He didn't write it to theologians. He wrote it for the common people let me prove that to you. Revelation chapter 1. I think it's verse 4. It could be 3. He wrote it for us. Yeah, verse 3. Because he said, Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things that are written in it for the time is at hand. So if God didn't want us to understand this book, why would he say, blessed are those who read this book? Amen? So, to boil all that down as we close here tonight, God said what he meant, and he means what he says, and that's all there is to it. God, there are some mysteries in the book, I get it. But the very plain things that God speaks, he said what he meant, and he meant what he said. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to close in prayer. It's just now another miracle. Straight up, 7 o'clock. So, <laughs> amen. Father, thank you for the book of Revelation. Well, Lord, I have been so amazed and studied this book for 40, 41 years, really, Lord. I'm still amazed at so many things I learn each and every time I try to read it, study it, teach it. There's always something new that comes out. I do thank you for this tonight, Lord, that every one of us in this building who are trusting you as Lord and Savior never have to see one iota of any of these judgments. I know that when you catch us up above, the doors will be closed, or it wouldn't be heaven. And then we will be enjoying your presence. The Bible said there'll be no more tears and no more sorrow. And there'll be joy. And there'll be no more suffering or hunger. But Lord, woe unto those who are left here behind. So Father, tonight I want to pray for not only us, but for those who might listen to this on YouTube. I pray, Father, that we would take this very seriously. Because I honestly believe that we each know someone who does not believe, who will not repent. And I pray, Lord, that you would just begin to put people in front of us that we could pray for them and share your word with them and warn them of the wrath to come. Because, Lord, honestly, there's not a one of us here in this building that wants to see anybody go through the judgment that's coming. So I'm thankful tonight, Lord, that we have assurance of your love of your protection and that you're coming to take us where you are and the place that you prepared for us. So we rejoice during this Christmas season, Father. We have hope in our hearts. Help us to spread it around. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.
punishment that was due for our peace was laid on.